I shut down a week before the government told us that we needed to shut down because we ended a Saturday night service and I looked across the dining room and it was packed and people were having a great time and you know, everyone just you know, cheers and fist bumping and giving each other hugs and kisses as they walked through the door and to me it was just like, wow, what if it's here? What if I'm part of the reason this is spreading? And it just did not sit easy with me. I spent my life protecting people and keeping people from danger. And for me, it was like, what am I exposing my staff to? What am I exposing my family to? What am I exposing my guests to? This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Australia is a nation of immigrants, excluding, of course, the traditional owners of this land, our Indigenous community. We don't have the rich peasant culture that created dishes over centuries, like Italy, France, China. Rather, we obtained ours in reverse. The food culture we love and celebrate is a direct result of migration patterns. Each new wave of migration resulting in a wave of the food from the original homeland of new Australians. It's what makes it so special. Along with that, international workers, tax paying workers, are the forgotten cogs that help drive our hospitality sector. They're falling through the cracks due to a lack of government support. Attila Yilmaz, owner of Turkish Mexican restaurant Pazar Food Collective out in Canterbury in Sydney, has quite an interesting perspective on the COVID-19 pandemic. He was a police officer during the SARS epidemic, a restaurateur during the pandemic, and he employs almost entirely international workers on visas. Attila, how are you going? Well, mate, as good as we all can be at, uh, at this point in time. I guess we're all sailing in the same boat and in the same direction and um, under the same winds. So, yeah, we're just you know, taking it day by day and, you know, seeing how it goes. Now, we're going to explore sort of the journey that you and your business and uh, your employees have been on in the last couple of weeks um, shortly. But... I thought we could start back because you do have a really unique perspective. You you were a police officer before you became a restaurateur. And I wondered if you could just tell us what that was like during the, the SARS epidemic. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I did have a, a hospitality background as a kid, only up until the age of 18, you know, in and out of dad's businesses. But uh, I joined the police as a, as a 24, 25-year-old and, um, and uh, unfortunately got injured around uh, 2000 and to 2003 um, tackling a robbery offender and there was a huge chance that I wasn't going to be able to return to, to full active duty um, and for me not to be able to do be active wasn't, wasn't an option so I, um, I invested in a uh, cafe slash restaurant um, in the idea of either flipping it or continuing it if I couldn't return to full duties and mate, it was... Um, it, it was an interesting time for me because uh, I experienced SARS from, from, from two, uh, two perspectives. One as a business owner um, in Camperdown, in Missenden Road, right near the RPA, across from Sydney Uni with, you know, depending largely on the medical profession, the university students, the hotel occupancy of the ridges next door. Um, for for our business trade, uh, to then also being a police officer around that time, and um, it, when this all when this uh, coronavirus thing all kicked off, you know, way back in in December, early Jan, uh, my spider senses started tingling, per se, and um, yeah, it was it was it was a difficult time. This is we're talking two thousand and three, and I distinctly remember you know going from one week doing amazing trade, then within two weeks dropping at least 50%. And it was nowhere near to the extent of the lockdowns and travel restrictions and everything that we, we have in place today. But I just knew how much it affected business back then and not just my business, every business in that street, Missing and Road, you know, Camp Town, you're talking about Newtown, you know, it's hustle and bustle, it's busy um, to virtually, you know, almost no trade within two to three weeks. And that wasn't just me, that was every single restaurant. So... It was certainly challenging um, as a business owner um, and as a police officer from a crime perspective, it left open a lot of opportunities um, for crime to occur 
uh, not so much out of the desperation that we might see in the future here, um, but more so just because it was opportunistic, because um, there were so many businesses shut, people weren't out and about as much, um, uh, which then, you know, leaves open the opportunities. And you sort of uh, touched briefly on sort of uh, the situations and circumstances which altered your policing career. Um, and you ended up leaving the force. Can you tell us about those circumstances and then sort of how you sort of dived headfirst into the food industry as a result of that? So let me make it clear, policing is still uh, a passion and a love of mine and I will always dearly miss it. And there's not a day that goes by I don't wish I was putting on my uniform and going to work. Despite all the successes and the accolades and everything I've had since leaving the police, um, you know, I, I really loved what I did and what I did in the police, what I enjoyed most was training the young recruits and breaking down barriers and cultural barriers and understanding and, and, and you know, teaching largely white-collar two-parent family kids about other cultures and, and understanding and acceptance and empathy and, you know, training people to run into the face of danger instead of running away because... We're not all born heroes. We're not all born with courage, and um, you know, and that's that's something I miss. But for me, the turning point was, you know, after almost uh, twelve years of policing and putting my heart and soul to it. Unfortunately, an incident in two thousand eight that myself and two other highly regarded colleagues and you know, what I would call hardened police, we walked into an incident um, in uh, two thousand and eight, and can say that we've. All three of us have never slept properly since that night. So I was diagnosed with uh, PTSD a couple of years, uh, two, three years after that, still performing at my peak in the police and you know, winning um, you know, highly distinguished awards and being nominated for Police Officer of the Year. But at home I was a mess. So I, was, I was falling apart and the, the PTSD was taking its toll. Um, and eventually did and eventually it wasn't healthy for me to be there i started second guessing myself which i'd never done and i didn't want to be the person knocking on your wife's door and saying hey or husband's door and saying sorry you know my partner died because i second guessed or i made a, a, a bad choice so for me it was um it was uh, a, a decision that i didn't make but in in the end, it was it was a healthy a healthy choice to leave, um, and leave with my head, head held high. And you did have that uh, food background as well. And you know, I've spoken to you in the past and stuff like that. And you kind of found a bit of solace in food. Can you tell us about that? And then sort of because early on you turned to food trucks as well. And um, tell us a bit about that little journey in that period. I've gone kind of full circle. So my dad was a single single dad raising two boys on his own from the age I was um, six and my brother was you know, only just one when my dad had sole custody of us. And it got to an age where, you know, dad couldn't work every day of the week. He didn't want to be relying on government handouts. So he started a little kebab van back in Canberra in the 80s, which – had cult status. Yeah, right. um, it was essentially a food truck. You know, these were three AM starts on a Sunday morning at the Trash and Treasure Markets. You know, twenty thirty meter lineup by three three thirty four AM. Um, yeah, Donut kebab was two dollars fifty at the time. It was just, and I just still remember it like the most awesome kebabs, all handmade, hand prepped, like nothing what you get today. It was authentic from dad's hometown where it's the birthplace of the donut kebab um but it was great and I had very very fond memories of that but you know then eventually dad saved up enough money got back into restaurants again and i was old enough work beside him he taught me the basics but you know fast forward years later you know, 12 years of policing i still continued to cook and explore and travel and you know cooking for me has always been um uh, you know, like my father, a way of saying, hey, I can provide for my family, I can provide well um, as a single parent. So it, was, it was a sign of pride for him, uh, especially as a Turkish man in a Turkish community, being able to throw a dinner party for a whole bunch of, you know, husband and wife couples, you know, traditional 
couples and, and, is, and, and to stand and hold his own to the point where the actual dinner party started to dwindle off because some of the husbands would chastise their wives that they weren't as good a cook as my father. So it was, you know, <laughs> um, it became embarrassing for them to come to some of these dinner parties um, that dad would throw. And, um, you know, it, it, it installed, I just remember the, the memories of food for me, uh, what bound us together, um, you know, as, as a small family unit, but also brought in an extended family in, in, in another community and other people's, other people, neighbours. My dad had a huge veggie patch. He would supply the whole street with vegetables, you know, um, for free um, because we just had an abundance of it. And it was just um, ingrained in me. And so, like, cooking for me was always one of those things. And, and look, to be, to, to be honest as well, you know, as a, as a young man, as a 17, 18-year-old running, running a restaurant and then, you know, start the dating scene, that not being the best-looking rooster, around quickly realize that um you know if you're in competition with another rooster and you're the better cook you're generally going to win um so never got really got good at making desserts uh you know normally entree is main and then but uh i i i just learned i just i understood the the, the bonding power of food and how much how much passion and how much friendship and what it can do to people and you know, i've just always loved it and you know, even through the police, if I had annual leave, I'd go work in a kitchen as a kitchen hand, or I'd go do something, or go travelling, or learn something. Um, and even prior to the police, whenever I had annual leave from any other job um, before then, I would spend that time in what might be an Indian kitchen, a Pakistani kitchen, an Italian place, just working as a kitchen hand. And they'd quickly catch on because they'd see my knife skills and say, "Well, hold on a second, he's um, you know he's worked in kitchens before." But it was just, I don't know, it was all about immersing myself in different cultures and different experiences and, and, and understand, which I then carried on to the police and, um, you know, tried to instill in, in the people that I trained and, you know, in the communities I worked in, which was largely the, the inner, west, um, inner west of Sydney. So, um, yeah, food for me has always been, it's in the blood. And I've got, I went full circle. I couldn't believe it. I swore I'd never work in a, in a, in a kebab van again as a kid. Because it was just a sweat box, and there I ended up back in a back in a food truck. And so, um, tell us about that food truck, and then what it led to. Because now you've obviously got um, bricks and mortar in in Canterbury, and um, um, just tell us quickly about because originally you sort of fired up with Mexican cuisine, and sort of what you're doing at Pazar is Turkish based, and there's a bit of Mexican there as well. So yeah, it's a, it, and you know it's largely. I mean, you know, the Asian flavors. There's a lot of other flavors that creep in. I guess, I guess we've only ever been re really reported on the Mexican, but I guess what what kicked off for me. I've always had a deep love of Mexico, and as a child, have vivid dreams of Mexico. Though I'd never been, had no Mexican friends or anything. My mum swears black and blue. It's because on day three at King George V Hospital in Camperdown, where I was born, she's gone to the nursing room to feed me, and I wasn't in the bassinet. It's gone over the feeding lounge. There's some woman breastfeeding me who spoke Spanish. So mum mum swears black and blue. She must have been she must have been Mexican. I got a taste of the Mexican milk and, and that's, you know, and that's where my love of Mexican came. But I distinctly remember having my first Mexican meal as a seventeen year old in Canberra at this very cliche place and eating this and having studied studied um Aztec Mayan cult, culture and history in high school and just thinking, hold on a second, thousands of years of uh, uh, of, uh, of this civilization couldn't evolve in stodgy nachos and shitty tacos. Um, I just applied myself over the years to learning about their culture and their food and playing with the flavors to the point where I would meet, you know, uh, uh, Mexicans who would eat my food and they would ask me if I'd been to Mexico and swear black and blue that I must have, and, and I never had. So um, uh, I, for me, the food truck thing, that getting into that, um, was actually therapy for me and it, and it stems from my policing days. I wanted to create a food truck so I could go and activate areas at night time just like what happened in LA and all over America and, and to be part of a, a culture where you can go and activate areas where previously people would, would not have ventured into. And the perfect example I can give of in the inner west where I work is um, Victoria Park at Camperdown where the Sydney Uni is right near Broadway. 
You know, that was the number one, and maybe still is, number one robbery hotspot in New South Wales. Uh, uni students were getting rolled, people were getting mugged there constantly to the point where we were doing you know, plain clothes surveillance in the parks, just sitting there two, three o'clock in the morning waiting for something to happen. Uh, and it did on occasion. But I also distinctly remember sitting there one night and, and looking across, and I was sitting there with a mate of mine um, in, in the cops who was also a bit of a foodie. I said, just imagine, uh, I said to him, you know, just imagine if there was a, a food truck or something here at night, some sort of activity, you know, some sort of uh, public eye or a, a night watchkeeper that people could walk through this park safely and feel and it would deter crime. So starting a food truck and getting involved in that again was actually therapy for me for my PTSD because I'm a hugely creative person and I found that whilst I'm being creative and designing and, 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 and doing stuff, it subsides my symptoms of PTSD um, and helps me cope with it. So really it all started for, as a a therapy exercise because I didn't want the meds. So um, that's how it kicked off. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty understandable. And if, if you haven't been to Bazaar Food Collective uh, out at Canterbury, it's the sort of place that if you drove past it, you wouldn't kind of know it's there and if, unless you knew about it, you know. But then when you walk inside, it's like this hive of energy. It's like being at a friend's backyard party, you know, like it's, you know, lots of people, lots of um, – energy lots of fun amazing food amazing aromas and um you know it's out in the suburbs i mean you know i've eaten there a few times i love it um I, um but you know i think what you've you know what you're talking about with the food truck is sort of epitomized in bricks and mortar as well in the sense that you've given the community something that you know that all of sydney could enjoy if they actually got in a car and and would love I mean, the, the original concept for the food, the food truck was this place, Pazal, was La Lapita back in the day, it was, was um, spawned out of the fact that the food truck was taking so long to fabricate. We'd won um, the, the tender for the, um, for the first 10 food trucks to be um, selected by the City of Sydney Council um, through this cooking competition and, and the hoo-ha and all that. And there was all this media behind it and everyone saying, where are these food trucks, where are these food trucks? Which had been announced months in advance, but it was taking so long to fabricate that, and I was bleeding money, and so I launched this place, what is now Pazar, was Lola Peter, as a, as a pop up, and I blacked out the windows, and it was totally clandestine. And look, I've been a law abiding citizen all my life. Um, I figured I was owed a few. I didn't have a DA to operate. <laughs> I didn't have a liquor license. I blacked out the windows and I thought, I need to test this concept now because if I, I might be building this food truck for nothing because if they're not going to come to Canterbury to eat my food, they're certainly not going to follow a food truck around Sydney. So we just started as a pop-up and it went gangbusters before the food truck was even built. Um, and we just laid out the kitchen in exactly the same format that the food truck was going to be laid out in just to test our, our method. And... Um, yeah, it, it went nuts to the point where it, it would not have been sustainable. We're talking 750 people, you know, Wow! on a Sunday coming through, 2,500 tacos, um, a line that was, you know, 20 metres up the road, out the door, mariachi bands. Um, it was crazy. <laughs> it was nuts. <laughs> we had, we, council rangers would come in here and sit down the back and have a few beers um, and I go up and go, look, you know, we don't have a DA, right? Like, we don't care. <laughs> we're, we're having fun. You guys are doing all right. Let's just keep it going. So that's, that's how it all started. Um, you know, to the point people would knock on the door late at night thinking this place was a brothel because the windows were blacked out and there was this little red light that streamed out underneath the door. Um, mind you, I'm thinking back and maybe I should have turned it into one because it might have been more <laughs> profitable. <laughs> Well, listen, it's Pazar Food Collective has, um, you know, been uh, won a lot of awards and it's um, quite celebrated um, and particularly stands out, you know, in the suburbs of Sydney as well as, you know, one of the best places to eat now. And, um, but, you know, like everyone in this industry, the last couple of weeks have just um, completely changed everything. Can, I know speaking to you before, before we recorded this that, um, you acted beyond, before 
the um, the government sort of closed down restaurants and and suggested only takeaway. Uh, can you can you take us through what actually happened and why you uh, acted so quickly? Yeah, I mean, as I said before, like around January, my my alarm bell started tingling. I was watching this closely, and because I'd been through it with the SARS thing, and in a heavily densely populated area with a lot of foot traffic, um, it, for me, it was a little bit worrying. We we're actually we were on the verge of signing a lease for another restaurant uh, mid February when this all started to really get serious and make a massive commitment to it um, to the point where I, we, we pulled out on, on that deal and, yeah, with great sorrow because it would have been awesome. Um, but, yeah, I started to prep for this back in mid-Jan um, thinking, okay, worst case scenario. And this is, I think, where my police, my policing has, has come in um, handy, although you can't really teach some of these things you know i'm always thinking three four five steps ahead like the what ifs it's like the choose your own adventure books when you're ready as a kid um you know and i don't know about you i always used to cheat and you know look at which one was the best yeah 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 Uh, except with this you can't cheat because you don't know um but so i i started to preempt it and and to to sort of kind of put some plans into place as to what we would and could do um but for me it really started i was watching it closely and i shut down a week before the government shut down um told us that we needed to shut down and cancel 200 reservations um for that week uh, because it, we ended a saturday night service and i looked across the dining room and it was packed and people are having a great time and you know everyone's here yeah, cheers and fist bumping and giving each other hugs and kisses as they walk through the door and to me it was just like wow what if it's here what if i'm part of the reason this is spreading and it just did not sit easy with me i spent my life protecting people and keeping people from danger and for me it was like what have I? What am I exposing my staff to? What am I exposing my family to? What am I exposing my guests to for profit? And so I decided to shut after that night. Um, I'd already started to kind of word my staff up for it too, that you know, to keep an eye on it, and we'd already put sanitizers in place all this sort of stuff before we were even supposed to and um yeah it was it was a tough decision but again on the other hand it was an easy decision to make yeah um i'm not a big restaurant group i'm i'm a sole operator i'm self-financed everything i own is in this i haven't bought a home or my life savings are invested in here so i have more to lose than than a lot than you know some of the, the big restaurant groups um and you know let's be honest that's who i compete with that's that market that we're reviewed in and rated against um but for me it was it, it was an easy decision um to do that a tough decision to let some staff go um but an easy decision nonetheless but i, I we we started to set up weeks beforehand and the capacity to run a drive through through our back laneway um, and we have an awning out there. It's a shipping container. It opens up to the public. Um, we can do con- contactless um, pickup uh, quite quite easily, and and we did um, for the first couple of weeks there. Yeah. So do you want to just tell us a bit about that? Because I know that you had some technical issues with that. Um, yeah. Are, are you still doing that, or is that have you put that on the back boiler? At the no, moment? no. We're still going to do it, and we're going to kick that off very shortly but to be honest mate i'm i'm burnt i'm fucking burnt and i was burnt from from before christmas it's you know it's no it's no word of a lie we you've heard jackie and um and the other guys on on your podcast talk about it it's just hospitality's been a fucking battle since december it has been brutal um and I'm a one-man show, and I have been for 18 months. I am head chef. I'm front of house manager. I'm reservations. I'm the maintenance guy. I do the rosters. I do the payroll. 
ordering, you name it, I'm doing it all. And I've been doing that for the last 18 months just because we can't attract industry professionals out to Canterbury. No one wants to work out this way. No matter what I've tried uh, um, in, the, in the last 18 months to two years, it's just there's a shortage. And, you know, I'm, I'm lucky enough that I design my menus and I design my system so that we need the minimum level of skill um, in our kitchens. Having said that, my guys in the kitchen who aren't trained chefs get paid more than probably some of the larger restaurant groups, sous chefs and, and the like. Um, Let's talk about some of your employees because I know uh, previously talking to you, um, you know, you, you want to give work to people that don't necessarily have the credentials on paper but want to work and you, you're a big champion of international workers on visas, which is a lot of your workforce as well. And the ramifications has been have been dire on them. Can you can you tell us a bit about what's happened with them and and your employees? Yeah, man, it, it's been tough. Like I, my father was an immigrant to this country, you know, and, and created his own opportunities. Um, uh, you know, and when he arrives, he, he talks about that you know never be really never been really given a go. But I'm the opposite, and, and, and I guess I was in the police too. You know, we got a lot of people joined that, that weren't really suitable for, you know, for it. And I was a, a training officer for their first six weeks in, and you know, we decide whether they stay in or they don't. Um, and to turn, you know, but I'm a big believer in opportunity and, and creating opportunities. And I'm proud to say that, you know, since we've opened here, I've sponsored two. Um, uh, internationals and created, you know, created lives for them in this country. Um, I've also believe in, 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 in giving people opportunities who, who show you know, a passion and a love for what we do. I think that's why we succeeded. I mean, you know, apart from Alex Martin who worked with us a couple of years ago, we've never really had any, any trained chefs in this kitchen. Um, so it's largely been based on unskilled labour and they've learned you know, from me and what I can teach and, uh, and so on and so forth. But the, the, it's, it's been tough because, yeah, don't get me wrong, we've tried to employ, employ local, um, but the only people applying for the jobs are internationals and that's the God honest truth. So, you know, I've, every time I've advertised, I've, I've, I've had over, you know, three, 400 applicants and I'm lucky I'm lucky to get one or two that might be local in there, but absolutely have no experience whatsoever. And that's not that's not a big deal for me either. Or we don't care if you've got experience or not. Generally, we we can teach you how to carry three plates and all that. As long as you've got a passion for food and love what we do and can pass that on to the customer, then that's great. So, yeah, I operate a little bit differently to to most hospitality places. Um, in that respect, but it, it's been really, really difficult um, because they are like family to me. They they have treated me like family as well. They've looked after me as much as I've looked after them. And you know, this place wouldn't be what it is without them. And it really guts me to know that if I can't keep this going somehow or some way, they are going to suffer. You know, I've got one guy. He's been with me for the last four years. He's, he's on the old 457 visa, which we just scraped through. Um, he's on that bridging at the moment for his permanent residency. The reality is if I close or go bust, he's going home unless he can find a job somewhere else. Which is pretty difficult at the moment. Which is difficult because they can't get home, for starters. Um, uh but it, which is why I say also that everyone I've employed here, I've put on part-time because a lot of them can only work 20 hours a week, um, but insisted on putting them part-time, paid part-time, put them on so they are accruing annual leave, um, they are accruing you know, super, all that sort of stuff, which I'm a stickler for. Um, it's, it's my number one thing. No one's ever been paid late. Uh, everyone is paid above award here. Um, and still being pro, you know being profitable, and we're only a four night a week business too. I, I cut twelve over twelve months ago. I cut this back to a four night a week business from five nights to make it more of a lifestyle business for some of my staff as well. Um, so they work 
you know, two of my guys work four and a half days um, and they def they always get their Sunday, Monday uh, off completely and then half their Tuesday as well. And they never rack up, you know, in our busiest times leading up to Christmas, they might do up to, up to 50 hours max. Um, but even if we do start to creep into there, I, I, I start to, you know, nip that in the bud and, and look at systems, what we can do to, to cut that back. So my kitchen culture is, is very, very different and always has been to many other hospital places. Well, what's the image of um, Bazaar at the moment? Like what's the, the status of the business and employees and, and what's going to happen in the next couple of months for you? Yeah, so, you know, it's touch and go. And it's such a, it's, the, the thing is that um, we really don't know. The, I mean, the direction is, you know, the, we've only got one option and that is takeout. Uh, but where do we go from there? There are so many places now that have converted to takeaway. So the competition for takeaway is now even harsher. Um, people's spends are a lot smaller. And so the considerations I have to make as a business owner are how do I serve people and serve them safely but in a speedy manner. And the reality is that the serving environment has changed. And, you know, we can do on a Saturday night here at Pazaar, you know, 260 to 330 people on a Saturday night. And we're only a small restaurant. We can only seat probably 110, 120 at a time. So we did two and a half, three seatings. We serve them no sweat. So I look at each table as a docket as an order and I look at each takeaway order so whether they're ordering $20 worth of stuff or $500 worth of product it's still an order it's still a table walking in the door and what we're finding now is that we really have in the evening an hour and a half to two hours maximum window of opportunity to make our money and the the the, the dilemma with me is that how do we do that safely? How many cars can you process through your drive through contactless, safely in that period? Um, you know, and the reality is you break it down, you can maybe do one car every three to five minutes coming through the drive through So that's kind of the stuff we're working on. Essentially what's been happening and what caused a major system failure for us was we had over 120 orders come through in the space of an hour and a half. So that's 120 tables all arriving, all wanting every single course delivered at exactly the same time onto their table and it just doesn't work. And, you know, and the thing is that we have a brand, we have a reputation and I, in my heart, I want to make money but I can't cut corners and I can't compromise on product. So for you to come and get eat here and go, oh my God, Pizarre's amazing. And next they come and get drive through and go, yeah, it wasn't as good as, you know, when we ate it. That doesn't sit well with me and I don't want it to be that way. So what we're working on now is something that is, if you came here, you had a shithole experience, I want you to go home and have a shithole experience. Um, but I really do. Uh, you know, I, I want you to go home and say, Fuck, that's even better than eating there. Um, and that's what, we're, that's what I'm trying to achieve. Um, I'm a bit of an A-type personality when it comes to that sort of stuff. But uh, that's, that's my major dilemma at the moment. And also IT issues. They've really let us down. Um, you know, I signed up to, uh, I won't name names, you know, they offered me the full support. We had web conferences, this and that. And this is prior to everyone going nuts over it. And all of a sudden, I'm no one to them. And all the other major players are more important than me. So getting IT support and getting people to help out to get the right system in place has been very, very difficult. So at the moment, I'm building it again, you know, on my own because... Um, Currently, I'm talking to Lithuania at 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the morning to try and get stuff done. And it's just 
as lovely as they are, and it's now my top three destinations to visit, because let me tell you, Lithuanians are the most polite people in the world. Um, go there, check it out. I'm going as soon as we can travel again. Top top three destinations, Lithuania. It's the only it's the only reason it's kept me with the, the our point of sale system is that the customer support are so damn polite. I feel bad leaving because someone might lose a job. Um, but yeah, that's that's the reality of it. So for me, I, I had this this dilemma on how do I serve the maximum amount of people in the minimum amount of time safely. What are the positives to come out of this pandemic? Personally, I've spent more time with my kids in the last week than I have in the last 18 months. Um, <clears throat> so I'm getting all choked up now because it's, it's fucked. It's, you know, that shouldn't be the case. I, I should have been spending more time with them. I shouldn't have been devoting myself to this business so much and trying to keep it alive and keep it viable and keep people employed. I should be looking after my own family. But on the other hand, it's made me realize how important they are. Also, it's made me, report, made me realize how important some of my staff are more so. And, you know, what the risks are to them. Um, so, so personally and professionally, it's given me a lot of time to, to sit and to rethink, um, to reassess the business model to reassess our, you know, some of our systems, um, which are pretty freaking smooth. I mean, if we serve 300 people with seven people in the kitchen, um, without breaking a sweat, um, but the takeaway game is different. We have a shorter window. We don't have a five hour seat, a four hour seating period. So, you know, the positives out of this, um, I've realised I've let, you know, I need this longer, but more, even more so, my health is of paramount importance because if I'm not healthy, the business isn't healthy, my family isn't healthy and I can't operate at, at my optimum and I've always kept pretty damn fit. And I've probably put on 20 kilos in the last, you know, 12, 18 months, easy. Um, too much drink, too much of the good life after work, just, you know, not focusing on what needs to be focused on trying to numb the pain and I've never been that way at all um, these are difficult things for me I have to deal with my own PTSD as well um, and when I'm running a business and not being creative that compounds and I've realized that even more so which says to me I need to get find the right person to come in here and take over the management of this business so I can focus on the creative which you know, we've tried to do, but it's a very difficult environment to kind of do that in. Um, but the, the, the biggest positive out of this is, 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 um, is realizing how important, you know, some of my staff and my family are and how much I've actually missed out on in life by trying to create, um, you know, jobs for people which is really what I've been doing for the last, you know, to be honest, the last 12, 18 months is, is keeping the business alive um, to keep people employed so they don't go home because I've made a commitment, I've made a commitment to them um, because it, it, there's a lot of other things I could do that would be a lot easier. Um, but then again, I've been through, I've been to hell and back and, I think my years of policing and what I've been through in my own personal life experiences have probably prepared me more for this than anything else. I, I, I don't know of many people that would be sitting in, in, in my situation running an entire business of this capacity on their complete own from kitchen to front of house to ordering to payroll to the whole lot. And I often sit back and think, how the hell am I, how the hell am I doing? <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, but positives, it's given time. It's, t it's given time for reflection. And I think this is, this is what I think the whole industry will be doing right now is reflecting on what they've been doing in the past, what they can do in the future. Because I think the whole dining scene is going to change when we come back and when we, and it's going to be a slow comeback too. It won't be. It won't be rapid. It won't be, okay, everyone's clear. Let's go back and, and, and open up again. Um, 
I also know that God damn you, all you internet chefs now, leaking all your secrets, teaching everyone how to cook, like you're cutting, you're all toe cutters. It's like, yeah, we're going to have no one to cook for. Everyone's going to cook better than us. I mean, seriously, the, the, people are going to come out of this being amazing cooks and self-sustained. Dinner parties at home are going to be the new thing. Restaurants are going to be old school. I think people are still going to want to rely on other people to do the work, though. I know I certainly certainly am. I think, uh, I think the big new trend, I'm starting that now, I'm trademarking it, will be um, kitchen hands. It'll be you know, hire a kitchen hand for a night. So you cook and then there's a kitchen hand to clean up for you afterwards so you can sit down and ent- entertain your guests. Um, hire a kitchen hand. Geez, that'd be nice. I do all the washing up here. Mate, uh, always always a pleasure to talk. Um, keep in touch. Let us know what happens during the year and um, and stay safe and thanks for talking to us. Thanks, mate. And, and thank you so much for your all your support over the years. You know, We get quite often forgotten about out here in, uh, in the the west and inner west and it's very rare that people venture out this way to to ride it and 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 support us but you have been a champion of 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 pizar and my staff thank you and my family thank you and i thank you and you're you're a gentleman and thank you for what you're doing for the industry awesome mate talk soon thanks this is the deep in the weeds podcast i'm anthony huckstep Stay tuned as we share the stories of Australia's HOSPO community, suppliers and producers in search of hope during this pandemic. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Stay safe, isolate and be well.